Happy, Happy Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving everybody. Everybody. <laughs> everybody, let's come to the dinner table. Now I went to Paris. Every day, there would always be this one girl in the class, who, in the back of the room, who just wasn't paying attention at all. So she would be sitting back and looking at the ceiling during all of the important lessons. However, one day, the Mr. Locke devised, uh, devised a new lesson because everybody was done with all of the other work. He said, nothing really too academic. He just said, draw. And suddenly, the girl was right on it. He didn't know what had caught her attention. So he went, went over to the girl and asked, what are you drawing? And the girl said, I'm drawing God. And the man said, but, but, but we don't even know how God looks like. And the girl said, well, you may not know what God looks like, but I am assured that you will know what he looks like in five minutes. So uh, that's the story. It's a super great one about education and imagination. Now I went to Paris. I'm not a fan of Mr. Locke. He's a horrible teacher, bad teacher. Oh, well, do you think you could go lower than Mr. Locke? Oh, how can you go lower than Mr. Locke? Yeah. He literally asked the student not to draw the god. Well, you can't stoop lower than Mr. Locke indeed. Really? Yes. Mm, okay. Now let me give you an example. So, it started when all of the children in the classroom had finished their assignment, but school had not ended. In fact, school was far from over. So, the teacher decided to give everybody an assignment, a gargantuan one at that. He asked everybody to add all numbers from 1 to 100. He thought that by the time they were done writing that problem in full, the bell would have already rang. Yet something amazing happened. Two minutes after the teacher finished, Gauss raised his hand. A small child named Gauss raised his hand. And the teacher asked, did you forget what I just said to you? Why weren't you listening? And Gauss said, no, it's something else. And the teacher asked, bathroom? No. <coughs> and you know what Gauss said? What? I finished the problem. He finished the problem in two minutes? Yes. And you know what the teacher said? What? You must be lying. Let me see your answer. And Gauss presented his answer. Five Hold on, guys. I have to help mom. <laughs> and Gauss presented the answer to him. What was it? 5,050. And it turned That out means 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7. You don't have to keep him. Is it gonna be really five zero five zero? Yes, and in fact, the reason he did it so quickly was not because he was just really good at doing uh, one digit, two digit, and three digit addition. It was because he devised a special equation in order to do optimize. What's his name? His name was Gauss. Now I went to Paris. So the book, The Republic, is about justice. Philosopher. 
This is an imaginary discussion, not a real one. Socrates had been poisoned and executed long before this entire story was written. However, Socrates was Plato's teacher, so Plato was inspired to talk about Socrates in his book. So they come up with an analogy for ignorance together. So they imagine a cave where prisoners are chained to the ceiling and they are forced to look at the wall, the wall of a cave. There is a dim fire behind them, lighting up the wall. And from time to time, people walk behind the fire, carrying animals or other objects. Mm -hmm. And that casts shadows on the wall. As those shadows on the wall are casted, those prisoners give names to the shadows. Like, for example, dog, book, cat, uh, stuff like that. <clears throat> and Plato saw the shadows as a metaphor. For all of those ordinary things, the things we are only able to perceive using common sense. However, eventually, to see what happens, the prison guard lets one of the prisoners free. And the, and the freed prisoner now walks outside, seeing what he can do. And the outside world is extremely disorienting to him. Why? Because there was such... One second, I, have, I need a pen and paper. I have to write something. One second. Okay. Okay, I have a question to ask you. Yeah, you can continue. Free prisoner walks outside and he is extremely disoriented and confused by the sun because he's never been exposed to such a bright light before. But he eventually gets used to the sun and all of the objects in the outside world. Still, he can't come to believe that all of the stuff, he, uh, all of the shadows that he saw in the cave, they were just illusions. And he saw this more perfect reality outside of the cave. And Plato saw the outside world as a metaphor for all of the perfect concepts, like beauty, and for, uh, for example, mathematics. And, he's, and Plato saw the Saturns as just a flawed, imperfect, real-life version of this, these concepts. So, finally, the prisoner goes back inside the cave to report his finding to the other prisoners. He is delighted by what he has seen, but he cannot see inside the cave anymore. He cannot find the prisoners because his sight, his, his sight has been adjusted to the bright light of the outside world. So his eyes are not adjusted to the dark light of the cave. Mm. So the others think that the outside world has made that person gone blind, uh, go blind, and they outright refuse to. Uh, they outright reject him. Uh, they don't just reject the offer to go outside; they reject him and shoo him away from the cave so that they can look at more shadows. So it's a really great and a touching story, not only illustrating how people, how ancient Greeks saw like the planes of reality, the planes of the higher world a long time ago, but also a, a, a lesson that is still relevant all the way 2,200 years to present. And that lesson is that a lot of people are ignorant and they will become very hostile to you if you point out their ignorance. Nobody wants their ignorance to be pointed out. <clears throat> Just like the, how the freed man pointed out the ignorance of the cavemen, and the cavemen shoot the free man away from the cave. So, it's a great story of how illusion, it's a great story of how illusions and ignorance keep you prisoner, and that how ignorance is bliss, but knowing the truth is always better. Now I went to Paris. And be ready, because I'm going to ask you guys a lot of questions this time. <laughs> you look a bit scared, Ma. <laughs> yeah, you're definitely scared. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. They're going to be easy <laughs> questions. A short summary of Aristotle's life. Sure. So, Aristotle was born in 384 BCE in the city of Stadua, Greece. It's not really a city anymore. It's a really small town. But anyway... He was born there in 384 BCE. When he was 17, he started to, uh, 
him to move to Athens, and he studied at Plato's Academy until 347 BCE when Plato had a mild case of death. After that, he, mm -hmm. when he was 37 in 347 BCE, he moved to the island of Athens off the coast of western Anatolia. Then, over there, the king was actually very friendly to him. And the king was also uh, very amiable to philosophy. And he was a friend of Aristotle. Aristotle met his first wife there, Pythias. After that, he moved back into Greece. And he was called by the king of Macedon, who was like, hey, can you tutor my son? And uh, Aristotle agreed. So, when this, so guess what the name Alec, of Alec, uh, Alexander? Exactly right. Mm -hmm. And guess who he would later become? Not, not you, Dad. Alexander the Good. The Good. <laughs> the Good or the Great. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, he wasn't really great in what he did to the people he conquered, but so, um, so that. And so he tutored uh, Alexander from what looks to be the ages of 13 to 15. Though we don't actually have much concrete evidence for how long he taught Alexander. Because we don't know much about his life between 341 BCE to 335 BCE. But anyway, after that, he moved back into Athens. But he was scared of being executed because... Uh, there was an anti-Macedon sentiment all over Greece. And considering his connections to the kingdom of Macedon, he did not want to be in Athens. In fact, some people criticized Aristotle for not being as brave as Socrates and not standing up to execution. However, Aristotle said, I do not want the city of Athens to commit a sin against philosophy for a second time. Presumably the first time was executed Socrates, but after that, finally, he died in 384 BCE, but not before writing two extensive books, one named The Republic and another named mm -hmm. Ethics. Now, the topics of the book Ethics are more related to today, but we're not going to exactly talk about ethics. Instead, we are going to talk about the values of virtue. In fact, you know how I talked about how Aristotle tutored Alexander the Great earlier? Mm. Well, he, he was said to have tutored Alexander the Great on the subject of virtue. Now, if you look it up, virtue is sort of like a synonym to good. Now I went to Paris. If I choose not to escape, am I choosing to die or to live? To to I'm going to talk about the great teacher of the great teacher, Socrates. Socrates was one of the most influential philosophers ever. In fact, for that, he is considered the father of modern Western philosophy. He was born in 470 BC, but he was executed in 399 BC, but for three reasons. Number one, he was executed because he didn't believe in the state religion. Number two, he had corrupted the minds of the children of Greece. And finally, number three, he was an impious man. Impious basically means not good, but they didn't really make it specific what not good act he committed. But anyway, for those three reasons, he was set to be executed. However, a few hours before he was executed, he was offered an escape route by some of his friends and his followers. However, there was a very solemn call conversation between him and his followers before he decided to decline the request. Now, can you, one of you please start the conversation maybe? Oh, Socrates, why you choose not to flee? Why do you think the king wants my head? Because of my body or because of my beliefs? Because of your beliefs. So, if I, 
ran away into exile and I renewed my beliefs, the king would be perfectly happy with that. But what kind of manner is it? What kind of manner of life is it to not have any beliefs, to not be a revolutionary? Is that a manner of life or a manner of death? Manner of death. And if what is more important, tell me. Should I sacrifice my body for my beliefs or my belief for my body? Your body, Your body for beliefs. beliefs. Even though I will not live forever, even if I am not executed, my belief will live forever no matter what, and I am sure of that. So, which one is more important, my body or my beliefs? Your beliefs. Nothing will be able to arrest my beliefs if I martyr myself for it. If I choose not to escape, am I choosing to die or to live? You're choosing to, to, to live. live. 